So it's been, it's been, what, about a year and a half, I think, since we did one of these. Yep. Uh, at the time, Boston Dynamics was a part of Google. Uh, I think you were searching for some new ownership at the time. And couldn't really talk about it last time you were on stage, but why was Google not a great fit for the company? Well, I don't really have an answer to that question. <laughs> but I will say that our time at Google was time well spent. And we got a lot of uh, great work done, in my opinion. And uh, Google was very good to us, keeping the work well-funded. And you're going to see most of the things we talk about today have their origins in things we did during our uh, four and a half years at Google. So uh, I think that uh, things were good at Google and uh, now even better uh, that we're part of SoftBank. So when SoftBank did approach you to acquire the company, what was the pitch? What were they looking for in a robotics company? Well, SoftBank is a very uh, future-focused uh, company. You know, the, uh, the founder, uh, Masa Sun, has a, uh, an immediate plan, a 10-year plan, a 30-year plan, and a 300-year plan. So which one of those do you fit into? Well, I think that the idea of being interested in both the long run and the immediate at the same time is really fits great with our mission. Uh, we are building robots that are going to be useful uh, this year and next year, but we, I think to build machines that satisfy our dreams of what robotics can do, you need to be investing in uh, longer term work. And uh, we, we're doing that as well. So our plan is to keep working. You know, over the years, Boston Dynamics has worked mostly on the future doing R&D. And we're going to keep doing that in a very vigorous way, and at the same time, uh, have some of our effort focused on making products. So let, let's, uh, let's actually play the Atlas video, I think, is a good example of something that might be um, a little bit further off when it comes to actually right. commercializing the technology. So this is um, the Atlas humanoid robot. And uh, you've seen this doing various things, but this is a piece of footage that we haven't shown before, where it's using a vision system to uh, locate the stairs and place its feet, keep its balance. One of the exciting things about Atlas is it brings together really sophisticated mechanical design and engineering with computing, controls, software, and perception. So it's really equal parts uh, a machine and a computation applied to that machine. And you couldn't do any of the things we do without that. And that, that computation has a role all the way back in conceptualizing the design, making the parts, simulating it, controlling it, perception, uh, collecting data, really everything. So here's a two-arm manipulation task that's at about human rates. It's using its vision to locate these boxes as they're placed in front of them. Of course, an obvious extension. You told, you told me as we were watching this earlier that that always gets a laugh and you're not quite sure why. Yeah. Oh, could you put that back on, please? Uh, and then this is very recent work we're doing on making Atlas run. Uh, there's a lot of dynamics and energetics in uh, the control uh, to make that work. And that work grew out of this, which is a kind of simpler jumping, but still very energetic. Lots of dynamic controls, uh, perception. <laughs> so, So I think this is a particularly interesting example of what you do because obviously um, you know, there are some far off practical applications there, but you're also showing some real world usage. So you're showing the Atlas in a, a fake warehouse setting moving boxes. When you're designing you know, a very sophisticated bipedal humanoid robot like this, are you thinking about those practical applications? We are. Um, I'm, I don't want to say that Atlas has an immediate uh, short-term money-making application, but we definitely use it to develop pieces of technology that can be applied to short-range things. For instance, using two arms to manipulate coordinated with the body is something that uh, can be used in simpler machines uh, for applications. 
Uh, so this machine, this work is really trying to push the boundary on the future, but we are harvesting component technologies that are used for other things. There are also pieces of the mechanical design, the way the hydraulics and the valves and the power supply, I don't have time to talk about them now. If you ask me later, I can tell you in. But those components can really play a role in many practical uh, applications today. Uh, is it safe to say that there's been a bit of a shift in focus um, in terms of your, your go-to-market strategy? I mean, it seems to me as though first being a part of Google and now being a part of SoftBank that it's perhaps lit, into, lit a bit of a fire underneath of you <laughs> to actually create a, a marketable device. I, I won't call it a shift. It's an additional focus. Mm -hmm. So I think before we were part of Google, we were mostly doing blue sky. Google got us interested in figuring out what some applications might be, and we reconfigured some of the robots. The Spot Mini robot, the small quadruped, is one that was motivated by thinking about something that could go in an office in a more uh, you know, accessible place for business applications, or in a home eventually. So we definitely started thinking about that as part of Google, and clearly in our current role, we're trying to maintain our R&D focus while we develop a, a very applied product focus. So, so you, you, I mean, you mentioned Spot Mini as an example of this. Uh, is this a device that we're going to, is this going to be on the market at some point in the near future? Will I be able to buy a Spot Mini for my office? Yes. So Spot Mini is in pre-production now. We've built 10 units that's a design that's close to a manufacturable design. Uh, we built them in-house, but with help from contract manufacturer type people. We have a plan later this year to build 100 with contract manufacturers, and that's the prelude to getting them into a higher rate production, which we hope to start about the middle of next year. And we are also working with proof of concept customers, that is go to market people, who are, have applications that we're gonna use, test these robots in this year with the idea that we'll be selling them into those applications next year. I'd love to actually play the Spot Mini video that we have because this is a good example of, I think, what can be done with the robot. And this is a, a relatively recent skill that I think you've only just shown off for the first time in the last couple of days. Yes, uh, this video uh, we posted to YouTube yesterday afternoon. You can hear, just use you your imagination of what a robot uh, would look like walking. I don't know why it's not showing. Uh, there we go. There we go. And uh, this robot is using cameras that are faced forward, backward, and to the two sides uh, in order to navigate through this space. We drove it through the space manually uh, to build the map, and it collected data, it built the map itself. And now it can travel where there's map data by localizing itself in the map. It also uses the same cameras to look for obstacles. So here it's treating the stairs not exactly as obstacles, but it can see the steps and orient itself with them. It knows it can't bump into the railings. If you look at that insert in the lower left, the brown things are things where it shouldn't go. And so the motion planning work, all the software, is taking into account where the obstacles are, where the green good places to go are, and coming up with uh, motion control, all in real time, doing lots of uh, high performance software execution as we go. We really expanding this part of our operation to have more people and more expertise in software perception and uh, building that part out uh, to match the uh, hardware design that we already uh, are pretty expert at. I imagine uh, the, the focus has shifted a little bit to some degree in terms of you know, developing this. I suspect this was a very expensive robot to develop, and if you're actually going to create a commercial version of it, you have to figure out how to bring the cost down. Do you have a, a specific price point in mind of how much it's going to cost me to buy a Spot Mini for my office? We're not saying what the price point is yet, but I'll tell you that this prototype, which if you just looked at it, you couldn't tell the difference from the previous one, mm -hmm. but it's about a 10 times reduction in cost. And we think we can go further, but we are trading reliability, performance, cost. There's a lot of factors in making this successful as a product, and we're working on all of those. I think one thing that you haven't really spoken to before is the idea of this robot specifically as a platform. So, you know, taking a, a PC or a mobile phone uh, as an example and applying it to this. So we've got a, there's a box on the top of the device. Right that uh, users can essentially install some sort of third-party apps on? Yeah, so the concept of Spot Mini is it's a hardware and software platform. 
And the robot is flat on the top with mounting points on it where you can mount your hardware. But there's also a network connection, an API, so that your software can talk to its software. And uh, you can develop, third parties can develop applications for it. We are developing our own applications for it that we probably will use as reference designs in the early phases. So, uh, for instance, we have a surveillance package where we have special cameras, low-light cameras, that can mount on the back. There'll be a camera that goes in the arm. It didn't show an arm there. And then uh, that computer is one that's designed to take user code as opposed to the code that's running in the robot. Why don't we bring out the robot? Sure. And, let's hey, let's actually see it in action. So here's Spot Mini, and uh, Seth Davis is operating it. It's not running autonomously right now, although many of the control functions are running on the onboard uh, computer. Seth, Seth is a guy that you never actually see in the videos, but, but he's in every single past video, there's been Seth or someone essentially doing Seth's job controlling the robot. And these videos that we've seen this week are the first time that this has really been demoed autonomously. Right. That's right. So, as I said, this is a platform. The arm is an extra cost option that you can take off. And that white box is a computer that really we're only using today because it's got a, a better radio than the standard radio. And in this environment where you all have cell phones and Wi-Fi, uh, it's sometimes a challenge to uh, get that working. So this is using a spread spectrum uh, uh, radio that makes it easier. Um, the robot's omnidirectional. When it came out, it was using a, a number of different walking gates. It's omnidirectional, so Seth can, just using a joystick, uh, steer it around. And uh, he'll, we'll, we'll have the robot out in the lobby after the talk, and if some of you will get a chance to drive. And let me just show a few things on there. Uh, there's cameras here. There's two sets of stereo <laughs> cameras. And there's also one uh, on the left. You want to turn it, turn it in place? So there's also one back here. There's a butt cam. There's another one on this side. Is that, is that, that a trademark name, the butt that, cam? We should, we should yeah, trademark that. Get on that. Um, the joints, this is all electric. So even though Atlas has hydraulics, it's got a quick disconnect uh, battery underneath, which you can't see here. Um, and again, the arm, which has similar technology to the, uh, to the legs. Uh, one of the things we love to do is show that you can stabilize the hand while the body moves. And this looks like a kind of a show-off trick, but really this is important if you're going to do manipulation in the world. You want to think about how the hand moves and not worry about the body. And I can do that. I can touch Brian over here on his shoulder and I can move my body all around and still my forces between me and Brian are, are pretty modest. And so we're building up that to do uh, mobile manipulation and uh, and other tricks. So we're not doing autonomous control, but you'll see that the sensors can be used to go over simple obstacles. So the robot is looking ahead and seeing these and using uh, quadratic programming in order to plan its footsteps so that it uh, goes over smoothly. You can see it, it arches the body up a little bit in advance. There it missed the, the thing a little bit. You want to go over sideways? This is riskier, but for you, so that because we have cameras, or you can go backwards if you want. If because we have cameras on the side, it can see the box and step over. You notice that the back legs stepped up and the front legs uh, didn't in that case. Thank you, Seth. Thank you, Spot. So, so I have to ask you, you know, as, as we're talking about these practical applications for a robot like this, I mean, does this really make sense as a security robot? Obviously, we've seen a number of companies develop these wheeled robots. These are out in the world right now patrolling areas. You know, why is somebody going to invest in such a sophisticated robot? You know, I think people think that most places are easy to get around with wheeled things. But uh, it's really not the case. Uh, almost every place you go, has some obstacle that wheel things uh, struggle with. Uh, in fact, though, there's also applications that really take advantage of uh, legs, such as uh, going in a skyscraper up the stairwells, checking for things left there that shouldn't be there. You can imagine uh, bad things left there. 
and we're talking to people who want to use our robots to go do those tests. You can imagine people wouldn't, uh, you might not like going up and down the stairs in a 20-story building uh, if you had to use your own legs on it and do it you know, three times a day or something, but the robots could do that. But even short of that, most places have something where uh, wheels uh, don't really get you everywhere, and uh, we think Spot Mini can go uh, to a much larger fraction of places. It, this seems like a case, though, where you know you've developed you developed these robots a while ago. Obviously, the earliest robots you were developing were for the military. You know, Big Dog was a pack robot. You, you've since shrunken it down. It's got an electric motor now. But um, was security really an application that had occurred to you from the beginning? Uh, it, it was on the short list. It's, yeah. it's only one. You know, we're also looking at construction. In construction, construction. Whereas productivity in other areas has consistently gone up, if you look at construction, it's almost flat. It, no technology mm -hmm. has really been brought to bear to help. So the people who are developing that are really hungry for help. And uh, there's BIM, uh, building information uh, management data that they want to collect automatically. There's uh, update status reports that you can do. So the application is very much like the industrial security one where you want to go around and use your sensors in order to assess what's going on. But here it's in a, a process where the environments are changing every day. The terrain uh, is very varied depending upon what the construction site is like. And so uh, that's another one. But you know, people send us ideas for applications of these robots um, every day. Uh, one that we get lots of requests for is uh, a wheelchair replacement because someone hasn't been able to go you know, out on a hiking trail uh, in their normal wheelchair and they wonder if we could build a, uh, a legged one. We're, we're not actively working on that uh, yet, but uh, I think it's, you know, and there's many other things. So when you talk about blue skying technology over at Boston Dynamics um, and you're developing these robots, I mean, is it important that it has some sort of inherent real-world value to it? I think that we don't want to let immediate ROI constrain our thinking for everything. And so that's why we have the two thrusts, the shoot over the horizon, make the future happen thrust, as well as the take available technology, and you know, Spot Mini's available technology, and work on applying it, work on cost reducing it, making it more reliable, making it more usable, you know, user interface, make the software better, uh, and see what you can do. But you know, robotics isn't like some fields where the, the applications are, are all well known and worked out, you know, so we're, we're simultaneously figuring out what the use cases are while we're uh, developing the technology. Well, you, you know, you've had, you've had quite a long lead time in terms of, you know, starting the company and actually creating a, a, a commercialized product. It's been about uh, 25 years at this point. Uh, I, I saw a talk you gave recently where you said you expect that, you know, robots are going to become essentially as ubiquitous as the Internet moving forward. I said bigger than the Internet. Bigger than the Internet, more ubiquitous than the Internet. How the, far out is that vision? Well, I, the idea is that the Internet lets you touch all the information in the world. But robots, especially if you combine it with the internet, let you touch everything in the world and manipulate it. And so, you know, that's a bigger idea. Uh, it's going to take a long time to get to bigger than the internet. Uh, but I do think uh, the impact of robots could be vast. And I'm, you know, we're working hard on uh, making that happen, as well as uh, a lot of other people, some of them you have here uh, at TechCrunch today. Great. Mark, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.